And so the last but certainly not least, we have John again uh, to tell us a little bit about the strategic planning that's upcoming. All right. So thank you very much, everybody, for sticking through here to the very end. Uh, before I want to get started, I want to do two very important things. First up is to give big shout outs to DJ Shelley, who has been And I, I am certainly going to, to, to also thank all of the organizers for the extremely hard work that they've been doing here. Um, this has been a very interesting way of doing a meeting. It's the first time we tried doing a hybrid meeting. I actually think it worked by and large. We had a couple of hiccups here and there. So um, one thing that's important to me is if you could get back in touch with me over the you know, days and weeks of thinking about how we can do this better. Um, or you know what worked, what didn't. You know these are important things to know because the future of meetings is is a different future, and we want to learn, adapt, evolve, and, and continue to improve how we're doing this. Um, a big giant shout out to uh, Quinn and Dimitri for for running this boat. Many thanks to the SOC for choosing such wonderful speakers. I think there's been a really great slate of science. Um, I'm, I'm super happy to see all of the, uh, uh, the grad students and postdocs bringing some really exciting, fresh stuff here to us because they're the future Keck users for the next 20 years. And so it's great to see them. M many thanks to all of the folks at UCSD who have done a lot of the logistics and setting up this space. Um, and now for my, if you, if you take only one thing away from this presentation, it's this. Uh, please take swag before you leave. The less we have to carry home, the better. There's plenty of neat little fans out there and stickers and pens. Please take them. Okay, so I'm here to talk, you know, about uh, where we're, what we're doing with strategic planning. And you know, when I think about planning and planning on horizons of long time scales, I'm reminded by one of my favorite quotes ever, which is, "For every complex problem, there is a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong." When you think about the complexities involved of running a place like the Keck Observatory, the science questions, the infrastructure questions, the, the implementation questions, the staffing questions, all those things, it's easy to trivialize what you need to do over the coming years. And so instead you have to engage in a, in a, in a pretty serious look at how you want to plan things for timescales significantly longer than say, two or three years. And so the last time we did this in a scientific sense was 2015. And what did we talk about in 2015 in the science strategic plan? Well, the 30,000 foot view of the science strategic plan in 2015 was, was organized around a set of guiding principles. You know, continue to push limits and faint object spectroscopy, Keck's bread and butter, lead AO imaging and, and spectroscopy with new capabilities, prepare for increasing opportunities in time domain astronomy, lead the ground and follow up for NASA flagships and continue highly efficient operations, right? So these were the grounding principles with which they went into the plan and made some recommendations about things, right? Well, what do they recommend? And let's see, let's rack up how we're doing, right? They recommended do the Keck Planet Finder. Andrew Howard is probably very happy knowing that the Keck Planet Finder is going to be coming next year, right? Do COPPA. You saw the slide, COPPA should be coming in around 2024, right? New spec PRV, AKA a laser frequency comb, that thing you've heard about a bit, right? KOA DRPs, we heard about that from Chris Giolino on day one, right? And various other things in here, looking at detector upgrades. We just talked about that for, for DMOS, high contrast AO. We've heard a lot of fun things about KPIC and various things like that. Next generation instruments, GLAO, deployable tertiaries. We have a deployable tertiary on Keck. So for those of you who haven't thought about strategic planning in the past, particularly some of the graduate students and postdocs in the room, it's documents like this that help drive what we do and the capabilities that we wanna bring online because we have to make this difficult decisions. As Chuck just said, he went through a litany of things that we want to do, but money and staff are not infinite. And so we have to make difficult decisions. Also included in there were new modes of operations recommended, things like TOOs. If you've ever executed a TOO, you have this science strategic plan to think because it kicks off the process of things like that. Cadence observing, which will become very important in the KPF era. Discretionary flex time 
various infrastructure enhancements. Keck now points where you want it to significantly better because of TCSU, right? Things like this, various, you know, the segment repair project, which was a massive undertaking and various other things at the infrastructure level. But now I wanna set the stage for the next one. And I, I alluded to this yesterday um, in, in the, the slides at the very end of the presentation, which is that we're now looking at a comprehensive strategic plan and we're calling it Keck 2035. So the first question you can and should ask is why 2035, right? Why should we be thinking about Keck 14 years from now? Well, I stipulate the following that the complexity scale and cost of future instrumentation requires thinking and planning on scales larger than five years. Many of the things that we're very interested in bringing as capabilities will take much more than five years to bring from an idea that's born out of a room like this today to the telescope at first light. And the things that we need to do to be competitive with other facilities in 2035 require thinking scales larger than five years in time. Right? And the second is that I stipulate in 15 years, the astronomical ecosystem will be radically different than it is today. If I contrast to this, what was the world like in 2005, the largest telescope in the world was Keck 1 and Keck 2. And sitting here today, the largest telescopes in the world are Keck 1 and Keck 2. Right? But the ecosystem in 15 years is going to be very different than it is today. Right? And in 2035, I picked a time that was after the lease renewal. Right? I am completely confident that there will be astronomy on Mauna Kea in 2035, but it may be very different than what astronomy looks like today. So what do I think? This is me reading the tea leaves of what the ecosystem looks like in 2035. Right? The first is that one or more extremely large telescopes will be in, the, be in operation, ideally three, right? but at least one, right? ELT in the south, but ideally TMT and uh, GMT in the south and north. Right. So we will not, the, the Kecks will not be the largest glass on the ground. JBST will not have only started its mission, it will have ended it in 2035. In 2035, that mission will be done. Unless they magically figure out how to refuel it, it will be done. The good news is they actually put reflectors on the back of it, so it's possible that you can refuel it. But I stipulate that it will be done. And Roman will already be seven or eight years into its mission, right? Beyond its prime mission of five years. So think about that, right? This flagship, which launches December 18th, will be done with its mission. Uh, Rubin, the Rubin Observatory, which has yet to start, will have been in operation for over a decade. It will have completed its prime LSST survey, which is what, 10 year survey. That will be done. Right? LIGO and other types of facilities like that, you know, non-standard, non-OIR, uh, multi-messenger things will have either significantly expanded, multiple LIGOs, better localization, or things like neutrinos and whatnot will be completely different, right? That whole landscape will have changed. A new flagship in space may be imminent, right? If you look at the large mission concepts, the, the Louvars, Habex, Lynx, and Origins of the world, they are all flying at around 2035 to 2040 if, if one of them is selected, right? And I stipulate that big and open data will be the norm, right? There will no longer be dragons hoarding their coins like Smaug in the mountain, right? Big open data will be the norm. Everything depends on the upcoming decadal survey, except for when it doesn't. What do I mean by that? You know, so many of the things that I stipulated in the bullets will get their origins in that piece of paper whenever that piece of paper drops, right? But many of these things won't. Big open data will not depend on the decadal survey saying so. Maybe it will say, maybe it'll issue new mandates, but it won't, right? It, what doesn't, the concept doesn't depend on the decadal. The idea of a flagship coming does not depend on the decadal. You know, whether or not we get one or multiple does at some sense, but there will be a future flagship from NASA at some point. And many of those other things in there, maybe the details of them depend on the decadal survey, but the philosophy behind them, I stipulate, will still be true in 2035, even if the decadal doesn't recommend X, Y, and Z in a specific list. So it's tempting to always just sit there and wait for the decadal. And yes, that's important, particularly for some things like funding and how you advocate for it. 
But I don't think it should be the rate limiting step for our vision for this observatory and this suite of science. It should be only a component, a piece, a critical piece, but only a piece. So instead, I'm going to introduce you to the complete set of boundary conditions I want you to use when you're thinking about Keck in 2035. These are the only rules that you should be putting in your mind. One, you cannot change the number of telescopes. And two, you cannot change their size. That's it, right? I think when you're thinking about timescales of 14 to 15 years for this observatory, you should not be, hold, be beholden to the way that we operate the telescope, the way that we use our instruments, the way that we use our data. We should not be using that through the lens of today. Now, many of those things will continue on, persevere, get enhanced, right? But some of them will end. And it's okay to think that way. When I'm thinking about timescales that long, I really don't think I should go beyond this as the set of restrictions that I impose upon my dreams today, right? So this now begins the process of what, what, you know, if I set, those are the only two boundary conditions, well, what kind of things do we care about, right? And equally important and a challenge, I think, for many of us in the community who love our instruments today is what things do we stop doing? because we will have to acquiesce leadership in some aspects to the larger pieces of glass out there. Well, do we continue to do high, through, high throughput multiplex spectroscopy? I certainly think so, but you know, it's for the community to decide, right? Phobos is a really promising part of this. Do we do deep wide field imaging? Chuck mentioned the wide field imager as a possibility. Right? right now we look at tiny patches on the sky. Do we instead start doing things larger than the field of view of Roman? Exoplanet focus capabilities. In 2035, the exoplanet field will look back at today and laugh, right? All of you are working on exoplanets today, right? Think about what you knew in 1994. Some of you may not have been born, but think about what you knew about exoplanets in 1994, and you can laugh at it, and people will do that in 2035 thinking about today. Rapid transient response. How the hell do you deal with 10 million transient events every night? coming from Ruben. How do you down select and what do you down select to? Lots of consideration about AO. There was a breakout session talking about, you know, the AO Future Studies Group. Do we need high strail over the, all of the sky? Do we need extremely high contrast? Do we want large efficiency gains over wide fields, GLAO? Do we want optical AO? Setting that path now, because I, I don't think you can get all of these, but Maybe I should, I'm violating my own boundary conditions. If you come back to me and you say, no, we need, we desperately need all these, because I remind you, we have two telescopes that thinking about that is important. I think this one's fascinating, but it's not the only suite of things that we can bring to bear. And data, right? How much of this is gonna be moving into the cloud? Should Keck be a science platform instead of a raw data engine, right? Um, and higher level data products in, 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 in the archive, right? At to, to, to what extent do you expect your data to be science ready and in some way pre-analyzed? Say you've got 2000 spectra every hour coming from Phobos or something like that. Do you want the system to also be giving you the redshifts of things and guessing this is a galaxy, this is a star, this is a da 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 da, so that you're going to higher level science right after your night is done. There's a lot of things I think that we can do to make Keck extremely powerful in terms of operations. Different ways of thinking about how we operate the observatory. You know, cadence observing is, is, is extremely important for KPF, but it's not, KPF is not the only instrument that gains from it. And so you have to think about, you know, is there, is there a way that we can optimize our, our time on sky better to get a better science yield? Do we need a significant expansion in how we're doing TOOs instead of you know, just an hour here, an hour there, double counting in various places, right? Should we consider one telescope for surveys and one for classical science? Should we be considering key programs executed on those types of things, right? And how do I leverage instrument systems? What do I mean by that? That's one thing that we, we haven't been talking about a lot here, but um, one concept is just to ex in, in give you an example is to think about systems of instrumentation, one of which I call the discovery engine, which is what happens if I actually have the wide field imager and Phobos 
right? What do we do right now? We take an image, we write a proposal so that a year later we can get the spectra so that we can write a proposal so that a year later we can get follow-up spectra because we realized the first set of spectra we got weren't what we wanted. We're now talking about two, two and a half years to go from the idea to the final set of science papers. What if instead I have a wide field image or take deeper than the LSST 10 year stack in two hours, plug it into an artificial intelligence engine that decides which of the targets meet your criteria and tell the Starbucks on Phobos to move while the deployable secondary goes and you get your spectra that night. You do more science in one night than you did in two years. But that only is possible when you have systems thinking. When you actually leverage the fact that you can plug these instruments in together, if you have the compute power to assign the fibers and the system works fast enough, that, that's a design consideration. That means you have to have the deployable secondary in Starbucks that can move like that, right? But this is just one example. This is the one that I get all jazzed up about. But I can, I can think, for example, in the, in the exoplanet field, there's plenty of things that we can do that, are go, that go from discover a thing to characterize a thing in the same night instead of waiting for a year. And don't forget, we have two telescopes. You've got two telescopes. One can be doing this, one can be doing that, same thing. OK. So where does that, where does that leave me? Because I'm sure I'm over time. Um, I want every person in this room and every person listening out on Zoom to actually think about this. I want you to think about what is your observatory? What is your observatory? What is your Keck in 2035? Right? What does that mean? What, when you look out at the ecosystem 15 years from now, what kind of science do you think this observatory should be doing for you? Right? So I'm gonna give you a couple of options on, on how to interact with us, right? The first is tomorrow at 10 a.m. We've got a half day session. There are slots still open. If you're interested in attending, please just go hit the register link that is still on the webpage. Shelly is nodding heavily. Starts at 10 a.m. It's all virtual on Zoom. If you wanna participate, please do. We would love to see you there. Two, um, submit a white paper. I am going to be putting out a solicitation for white papers. Um, I will send it to every person who came to this meeting for that solicitation and ask you a, a couple of questions for you to expound upon. These are not long white papers. I'm not expecting 20 pages back. I'm expecting two. I want you to spend more just you know, getting to the essence of your idea, not, not, the, not, the, not the details, because I don't think we can get into the details on 15-year timescales, right? The second is uh, contact me directly with your thoughts. You know, I'm easy to find. Give me a call. We'll have a, have a chat, right? Um, if you could leak the Astro 2020 recommendations to me right now, I would appreciate it. Um, and, you know, with that, I just want to say thank you to everybody for participating. Thank you for everybody who helped facilitate this meeting. And for those of you who are thinking about tech strategic planning, thank you in advance. Your input is absolutely critical to the success of this strategic plan. In particular, if you're a graduate student or a postdoc sitting in this room or listening right now, this is your observatory and will be for decades beyond this. So help start the path now. And with that thought, thank you very much. Happy to take questions.